Chapter thirty three of the Alps, the Danube, and the Near East. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. Constantinople. I have come to Constantinople through the Black Sea and the Bosporus. Taking ship at Constanza in the delta of the Danube, I crossed from Roumania to Turkey in a Roumanian vessel. The Black Sea is more than five times the size of Lake Superior. It is nearly as big as the Baltic, and its only outlet is the Bosporus Strait, 19 miles long and from a half mile to two miles in width, which connects it with the Sea of Marmora and the Mediterranean. We left Constanza at night, and the next morning found ourselves at the entrance of the winding strait separating Europe and Asia. The Bosporus is perhaps the most famous small body of water in all history. Its very name comes from a story in Greek mythology. Bosporus means ox ford, and the strait was so called because the beautiful maiden Io, transformed into a cow by the jealous wife of Zeus and pursued by her wrath, fled across it from one continent to the other. We entered the strait near a point named Anchor Key, for the anchor that Jason found here when he and the Argonauts were seeking the Golden Fleece. On the European side is the giant mountain where Jason made sacrifices and built temples, and where Darius, the great Persian king, stood and looked upon Europe. The Turks have a tradition that Joshua, the son of Nun, came to the Bosporus to live after he had conquered Canaan, and they show you his grave near a mosque on the mountaintop. Their story represents Joshua as frequently standing astride the strait and letting the ship sail between his huge legs. He also loved, they say, to sit of an evening on the summit of the mountain and lave his feet in the water, which was more than two hundred yards below him. While we waited for the quarantine officers to look us over, we anchored under the mountain at the town of Kivak, not far from some standard oil tanks, then wound our way down the Bosporus between the villas and villages that dot both the Asiatic and the European shores. There are many hotels rising from the waters and here and there we saw palaces built by the sultans. The biggest of all is Dolma Bagche, which stretches for more than a third of a mile along the strait, its white marble facade gleaming in the sun. It was built some 70 years ago, and the architect's only instructions were to erect a royal palace more splendid than the sultan of that day had ever beheld. Yet, in spite of its magnificence, it fell into disfavor, after one sultan committed suicide and another went insane within its gorgeous walls and it is whispered that the place is haunted it was here that the caliph abdul Mejid, the last of the line of osman was told that he must leave turkey forever from the black sea to constantinople the bosporus is walled with hills i noticed castles on some of the heights and both shores seem fairly well settled the country appeared ragged and rough but many of the villas had beautiful gardens. Everywhere were signs of the poverty of the Turks. All the buildings lacked paint, and the windows were like bleary eyes looking out of faded faces. Here and there were new and well-kept structures, among them some buildings flying the American flag. One of these flags belonged to Robert College, the greatest educational and westernizing institution in this part of the world and another flew over the American College for Women, which holds the place in the Near East that Vassar, Smith, and Wellesley have in our country. As we neared Constantinople, the waters were filled with shipping. There were great steamers lying in the harbor and hundreds of cakes. The famous canoe-like boats of the Turk were being rowed about. There were barges loaded with lumber and other cargoes and ferry boats filled with commuters, red-fezzed passengers traveling back and forth from their homes on the strait there are fifteen different stops on the bosporus and the prince's islands and morning and evening the boats are packed like the ferries of new york coming down the strait we had a fine view of this great city of more than a million with its hundreds of minarets cutting the sky and standing out like so many white pins on a huge cushion of green the city seems to rise from the edge of the sea. Its hills are crowned with mighty mosques, some of which cover acres, and from the minarets the shrill, tenor voices of the musons 
calling the hours of prayer ring out across the water constantinople is divided into three parts galata and pira form one section here most of the foreigners live modern business has its headquarters and the sultans had many of their palaces in scutari the most fanatical of the turks have their homes and there after the world war tens of thousands of refugees were cared for by the american doctors and nurses of the near east relief stambul is the most important part of the city it contains the bulk of the mohammedan population and all the great mosques in stambul are the bazaars the sublime port the headquarters of the turkish empire before the new government was instituted at angora and in short everything that is essentially turkish stambul is separated from pira and galata by the golden horn a deep inlet about a mile wide where it joins the bosporus but narrowing as it curves in between the two cities and goes back into the country to meet the stream called the sweet waters of europe the bridge of boats over the golden horn connecting european constantinople with moslem stambul is one of the most remarkable bridges of the world it surpasses in interest the rialto in venice upon which shylock bargained with antonio for his pound of flesh brooklyn bridge that great cobweb of steel joining new york and long island or even the thames bridge in london which bears perhaps more traffic than any bridge in the world it is said that three hundred thousand people and not more than one idea cross the galata bridge every day it is the throng that makes it so remarkable for here is presented a moving picture of humanity such as one can see in few other places on earth stand beside me midway between stambul and pira and a hundred feet above the waters of the golden horn of the more than a million inhabitants of constantinople only about one half are turks and the rest of the population is made up of greeks armenians jews and all the strange characters you will find in this part of the world there are tens of thousands of jews here comes one now he is dressed in a black gown and from each side of his fur cap hangs a long curl showing that he belongs to that crowd of spanish jews whose forefathers came here when they were driven by persecution from spain behind him struts a greek catholic monk and on the other side of the bridge is a dervish whose arab features are crowned with a high tan-colored cap which stands fully a foot above his head and looks like an inverted tumbler the dervish wears a long black gown and his face has numerous scars for he belongs to a sect of fanatics that mutilate themselves in their religious ecstasy among the next passers-by are two flabby-faced eunuchs as black as the charcoal in the basket being carried by the porter behind them each has a stick in his hand and both talk in shrill piping voices as they pass notwithstanding the decrease in the harems eunuchs are still to be seen in constantinople those men are probably going on errands for the wives of some bey whom they guard behind the eunuchs is a circassian a big man with a black beard whose breast is covered with cartridge boxes his clothes are half european he has a dagger in his belt and he wears the uniform of a soldier with him is a greek dressed in ballet girl costume at each end of the galata bridge are turkish officials who are supposed to collect a small sum from all who pass across from the pasha and the bey to the porter and the beggar not long ago when the taxes were raised the women who had previously been exempt were included among those who must pay toll but they refused to do so this put the officials in an embarrassing predicament for according to the turkish idea a man's wife or daughter is his own special property and no other man may lay hands upon her therefore the tax collectors dare not interfere with the woman who goes on her way without paying toll most striking of all the characters on the bridge are the hamals or porters the hamal of constantinople belongs to a union in which membership is passed on from father to son boys begin to carry burdens at eight and ten years of age and they are still carrying them when their hair is white at three score and ten here comes a hamal with a load of boards big enough for a mule 
I am told that a porter will take a length of eight-inch iron pipe up the hills of Stamboul on his back. See those three men, each with a three-bushel basket full of watermelons fastened to his shoulders. The melons are held in by a net over the top. Other porters are bent double under dry goods boxes, tables, stools, even upright pianos and beds. These porters are the ash collectors of the city. I see them every morning tolling up to the dumps, which lie between my hotel window and the golden horn. To protect his back, the Hamal wears a triangular saddle, or padded cushion of leather, with a projection at the bottom to prevent the load from slipping. As I write these notes, my guide grabs my arm and jerks me out of the roadway. A caravan of camels is coming, and one of these ill-natured beasts might bite me as he passes. This caravan is led by a man with a donkey, which the guide says is a common custom throughout the country. To my surprise, the camels pay no attention to the automobiles. Behind them are mules with panniers, bringing in stuff from the country, and amid the traffic are horses, and even the black, ugly water buffalo, half hog and half cow, drawing all sorts of vehicles. I notice the blue beads that hang in strings around the necks, across the foreheads, and on the tails of the beasts. Every animal has them to ward off the evil eye. This superstition has even extended to automobiles. When I was out yesterday, I saw a car driven by a gowned and turbaned Turk, which had a strand of blue beads wrapped around the radiator cap at the front. The man was going like the wind, and I doubt not he had implicit faith in the charm. Speaking of automobiles, these Turks have no speed laws, and their driving is the most reckless I have ever seen. The main street of Pira is just wide enough for two cars to pass, and the red-fezzed chauffeurs fly in and out at a speed that would get them arrested in any American city. Even the street cars are dangerous, for they come so close to the narrow sidewalks that their sides are apt to skin one's legs as they pass. They go like mad, and the ringing of their bells vies with the honking of the automobiles. Constantinople is a noisy city. Street peddlers shriek out their wares. The Hamals yell to people to get out of their way. The pavements are of cobbles and every vehicle rattles. Right next, my hotel, is the Petit Champ, a garden where jazz music and singing keep up until three o'clock in the morning and where the after-midnight sights would disgust Vienna, Paris, or Berlin in the days of their greatest degradation. I do not always sleep well, and I try to drop off by keeping time to the music. At about 3 a.m., the din dies down and the city is quiet. But even then, I hear the resonant sounds of the policeman's club as he walks his beat, tapping the flagstones every so often to warn the thieves of his coming and to show the city fathers that he is still on the job. End of chapter 33